if Jesus' death on the cross and his coming back from the dead, his resurrection, if they are facts, then we have solid reason to believe there is life after death and a God there to whom we're accountable and whom we will meet. As we stand, I'll say a prayer. Father God, as we think now about what happened that first Easter, help us to see what it tells us about you and what it means for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please do take a seat. A week ago last Friday, I took my father's funeral. And in the address, I quoted this from his wishes, which were written on a bit of paper headed to be read when I die. I have no belief in any God or in life after death. I wish for the minimum of ceremony, but forbid anything with religious implications. I accept that some sort of funeral may be of comfort to my family. I suggest you sit and listen to cheerful music for a while and then go and have a good meal. He wrote that years ago, so I don't know whether he gave his beliefs a second thought, but as I said in that funeral address, what anyone else believes is besides the point, because when it comes to death and what lies beyond death, none of us can hide behind the belief or the unbelief of others. In the face of death, you and I stand absolutely alone, and we each have to decide on our own what we believe and why. And actually, most people do have a sense that death is not the end. They certainly mostly have a wish that it's not, which is why my mother wanted this poem read at the funeral. Perhaps if we could see the splendor of the land to which our loved are called from you and me, we'd understand. Perhaps if we could hear the welcome they receive from old familiar voices, all so dear, we would not grieve. Perhaps if we could know the reason why they went, we'd smile and wipe away the tears that flow and wait content. Now, Mum is not a Christian either, but she said, I find it comforting to think that might be true. And surely the most important question is, can we actually go any further than saying that might be true? The problem when it comes to death and what lies beyond is how do you know? You could actually only know if someone went through death and came back to our side to prove it and tell us what it was like. And the New Testament says that is exactly what Jesus did that first Easter. And you need to decide whether you believe that or not. If it's true, if Jesus' death on the cross and his coming back from the dead, his resurrection, if they are facts, then we have solid reason to believe there is life after death and a God there to whom we're accountable and whom we will meet. And for the rest of the time, I want to uh, take us back to that second Bible reading we had to look at the evidence for Jesus' resurrection and what it means for us today. So I wonder if you would turn to page seven of your service sheet page seven of the service sheet and um, printed out as Jonathan said that's part of the New Testament Um, it's part of John's gospel John was an eyewitness of Jesus life and death and resurrection and uh, his gospel records what he claims to have seen and heard the background as we heard in our first reading is that on the first Good Friday Jesus had been put to death on the cross by the Roman authorities He'd been certified dead. His body had been released for burial. Two of his followers had taken it and put it in a nearby tomb. It was too late late in the day on that Friday to do any more of the burial treatment. The next day, Saturday, was their rest day, and so the plan was to come back first thing Sunday and finish the job. So they closed the stone door of the tomb and left. And the other Gospels tell us that the authorities also put a guard on that tomb. 
because to them Jesus had been a high profile and worrying cause of unrest and they wanted no tampering with the evidence that he was dead so that his cause would die with him. And then this second reading picks up events from first thing on Easter Sunday. Some more of Jesus' followers went to the tomb to finish the job, but the guard had gone, the tomb was open, and it was empty, without the body and just the grave clothes. And Mary, one of Jesus' followers at the tomb, comes up with the obvious explanation. She says, someone has moved the body. So just in passing, notice that these eyewitnesses whose evidence we either have to believe or disbelieve, they were no more gullible and quick to believe in a resurrection than you and I. She thought someone's moved the body, just like you would have done. But who could have moved the body? Like I said, we know that the authorities were guarding the tomb and the only possible explanation for that guard leaving is that for some reason they had checked the tomb that Sunday morning and found it inexplicably empty. So the empty tomb is the first piece of evidence for Jesus' resurrection. The second piece is that the eyewitnesses say they saw him alive again. So on page 7 of the service sheet, a third of the way down, you'll see little number or verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, in other words, Easter Sunday, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. So this was recognizably Jesus. The same Jesus who was nailed through the hands to that cross. The same Jesus who had a spear shoved up into his lung cavity to check that he was dead before his body was released. But he obviously didn't just look like a resurrection, limping in, bleeding and wounded, where your first instinct would have been to ring 999 for an ambulance. He's, he's a transformed body. He didn't need to knock at the door because he didn't need to use doors anymore. He wasn't locked into time and space and mortality anymore. It was a body ready for heaven. But then skip down to verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And you can see his point, because all experience says dead men stay dead. A friend of mine uh, called Paul when he was a teenager, he once looked after the neighbor's pets while they were away, and the first day of going around to feed them, Paul took his dog, and after he'd finished with the pets inside, he came outside to do the rabbit, only to find the rabbit dead in his dog's mouth. So Paul thought, what do I do, confess or cover up? And he thought, cover up. Um, thankfully, it was a black rabbit with no distinctive markings, so he bought one in a pet shop, which was a reasonable match, and popped it in the hutch. The day after the neighbors got back, they phoned him, which was the call that he'd been dreading, so he nervously said, you know, how are the pets? And the neighbors said, um, they're fine. We were just a bit surprised about the rabbit. We, we realized we forgot to tell you before we left that the rabbit died the day before we went. <laughs> and the, the kids insisted that we bury it in the garden, and we're now trying to explain to them how come Sooty is back in his hutch. Um, and you can, see, you can see their point. Dad, dead, rabbits stay dead. Only dogs will be dogs and dig them up again. And dead men stay dead. All experience says that. Except this experience. And you've got to decide whether it's true or not. Look on to verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Don't disbelieve, but believe. So if all experience says dead men stay dead, what category are you going to put Jesus in? I'll tell you which category Thomas did. Verse 28. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Thomas had once heard Jesus say this about himself. 
Jesus said, as the Father, that is God the Father, has life in himself, so he has granted the Son, that is Jesus, to have life in himself. And Thomas was now seeing the truth of those words in a human being standing in front of him. You and I do not have life in ourselves. We are going to conk out very, very soon. Whereas God does have life in himself. God is going to live forever just as he always has lived forever. And Thomas has just seen that kind of life in an apparently indestructible man, which means that he cannot just be a man. And Thomas is shunted into putting him in the only category that makes sense. That is that somehow he is God become man. And so he says, my Lord and my God. And that's the third piece of evidence for Jesus' resurrection. You've got the empty tomb. You've got the eyewitnesses saying they'd seen Jesus alive again. And the, the total change that took place in those eyewitnesses. Jesus' death on the cross had destroyed their faith in who he was. And yet just weeks, within, within weeks of what we are reading, people like Thomas were preaching that Jesus was the rightful Lord of God, Lord and God of everybody in this world, and they were ultimately willing to die for that message. And the question is, what else explains all that if not the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? That's what you've got to decide. Now, you may be thinking, I'd actually like to believe this. I'd like to believe that, that God has been here in the person of Jesus to show us what he's like, to show us that there's life beyond death. But I would need the same kind of level of proof that Thomas had, and the trouble is I'm never going to get that because he was there to see with his own eyes, and I wasn't. And if that's what you're thinking, what Jesus said next is directed at you. Look at verse 29 of that reading. Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you've seen me? In other words, seen the evidence with your own eyes. Well, blessed are those who've not seen and yet have believed. In other words, Jesus did expect the likes of you and me to be able to believe without actually seeing the evidence with our own eyes. He knew full well that we needed the evidence the evidence of what Thomas and the others saw. That's why he called them to be his official eyewitnesses. That's why they wrote this stuff down. And so looking on to verse 30, John says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you who weren't there may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, I realize that from the Da Vinci Code to Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, plenty of people are saying to you, you can't trust the New Testament. And all I want to say to you is, only you should decide whether or not you can. Is that a fair comment? You can't believe because C.S. Lewis does, and you can't disbelieve because Richard Dawkins does. You can't outsource the decision about your eternal destiny. At least I can't. And you can only decide by giving it a look yourself. For example, you, you might like to join our Christianity Explored course that looks at Mark's, Mark's Gospel. Gives you the chance to air all the doubts and questions and objections that you like. But let me end by saying something for those here who do believe this is true, but are wondering, what am I supposed to do to, to respond? Uh, to be a Christian. Well, thankfully, John tells us that in verse 31. He says, I've written my gospel, verse 31, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So being a Christian, it, it means believing that certain things about Jesus are true. I have to believe that he's the Christ, which is just Bible speak for God's king over everything. In other words, he is the rightful ruler of all our lives. And that goes hand in hand with believing that he's the son of God, because only God has the right to occupy the throne of my life. 
But just believing that certain things about Jesus are true doesn't get me to being a Christian. Because at the end of verse 31, John, John says what it means to be a Christian is to go beyond that and that by believing you may have life in his name. By which John means life back in relationship with God. Life where you have been forgiven the past of living as if he was not king. Life where you're now living for him, knowing that he will keep forgiving you whenever you fail, and knowing that when you die, you will go through death just as Jesus did and be welcomed by Jesus himself the other side. And paying for the forgiveness that that underwrites all that is why Jesus came to die on the cross. When he died there, he was taking on himself the judgment we deserve for the wrongdoing of all our ignoring of God and hurting of others. So that on, on the one hand, we could be forgiven our wrongdoing, and on the other hand, justice could be done on our wrongdoing. And you may be very aware of your wrongdoing or sin, as the Bible calls it, very doubtful that God could possibly accept you. And the amazing thing at the heart of the Christian message is that, very end of verse 31, God is offering us this life back in relationship with himself in his name, that is, in Jesus' name, on Jesus' account, if you like, on account of what he's done on the cross to pay for our forgiveness. My brother, Neil, works for Vodafone, and so I get the perk of a family and friends discount mobile. And he was horrified last year to discover that I had not upgraded my phone for nine years. And he said, instantly, I'm going to get you the latest iPhone. And uh, a text arrived later that day saying, it's all sorted and paid for. Just go to the Northumberland Street and mention my name. So in I went, and I pulled out my prehistoric coal-fired Nokia, And um, the shop was quiet. There was no one else there. The manager actually called over all the other assistants. And he said, look at at this. You will never see a phone this old again, you know. Some of them had still been in primary school when I had that phone the first time. All I had to do to walk away with the new one was mention Neil's name. It was all sorted, all paid for in his name. And the forgiveness you and I need was all sorted and paid for by Jesus on the cross. And all you have to do to walk away from this building this afternoon, a Christian, is to ask him to forgive you on that account and to ask him to come into your life by his spirit, to be your king, to be where he should be. Now, many of us are further on and have done that already. Others are much further back, needing to look into this more. It's it's way too soon to be thinking of making up our minds. But there may be someone in the middle here saying, I know all this is true, and I do want to respond to Christ. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to end with a prayer that would be a way of doing that. I'm going to read it out first so that you can decide whether it would be appropriate for you. So here it is. Lord Jesus... I have not lived as I should with you as my king. Thank you for dying for me to bring me back to yourself. Please forgive me and please come into my life by your spirit to enable me to live for you from now on. Now, as I say, you may be further on, you may be further back, but for some of us, that may be just what you want to pray to the risen Jesus Christ. And if if that is the case, you could echo it in your mind as I lead us in prayer now. Let's bow our heads to pray. Lord Jesus, I have not lived as I should with you as my king. Thank you for dying for me to bring me back to yourself. Please now forgive me And please come into my life by your spirit to enable me to live for you from now on. Amen.